All righty, everybody. Welcome in. Good to see everybody here on what will be our final episode in this mini series on interference. It's been a six week journey here for us uh, on interference. We've broken it down into a variety of different categories. Started with umpire interference, went on and talked a little bit about batter's interference, the runner lane violation, runner's interference last week. And then this week, we're going to go ahead and kind of hit everything else that's left. So that includes like catcher's interference, coach's assist. Uh, we'll clean up the double play, interference on a retired teammate, spectator interference. So uh, I kind of labeled it the, the buffet of interference essentially on tap here for us. So looking forward to going ahead and closing the door on interference for us today uh, and then really kind of taking a look at your takeaways. And that's kind of my big question here as we go ahead and get set. You know, as many of us have, have listened to a lot of these different presentations and thought about interference, just think about back through the week, uh, back through the weeks and through this series, just some of your big takeaways and what you have come to, to really take away from our conversation so far um, on interference. Uh, we'll break next week for Easter, so we won't have a, a meeting next week. So these are my announcements here. So no live meeting next week here uh, just because of Easter. And then we'll pick back up the week after that. I think the date would be the 9th of April, that next Friday, April the 9th. And we'll start then with a new mini series. That one will actually be on obstruction. So it'll tie hand in hand to where we're coming out of with interference. And again, April 9th would be um, on obstruction. A bunch of resources have been uh, produced here within the this season, season and four um, and I'll get those out to everybody probably spend the next you know couple days cleaning them up and then getting them out to you guys next week as well um, and then also next week we're really excited about it um, I see Greg Ramos is on so is, is Seth the uh, committee uh, in the central region is going to get together and do a video presentation together video recording of our focal points so we released those um, and kind of talked about those uh, intermittently throughout here on our episodes of three up three down but we'll have some video evidence some some commentary and some direction here uh, for those focal points as well so um, that's kind of my brief announcements here again no meeting next week I'll remind you that again at the end of um, the session here today uh, but today then we'll go ahead and finish up with interference the last thing I've got announcement wise and then I can kick it over to Tom here uh, to, to touch base if he's got anything else to add into the mix um, I know that we have had with the virtual umpire series um, some some date changes so just be aware of those on the uh, umpire registry um, and then you can obviously catch those on the recording um, uh, either on the registry or through little university so tom anything else to go ahead and throw in uh yeah not not exactly interference related but i promised last week i'd attempt to get a question answered about the batting order spot with the uh the runner being called out for the third out of the inning, the batting order spot will not clear. So if it was the number six batter who hit that foul fly uh, where we called his, uh, his compatriot out for interference, it counts as his turn at bat for mandatory play. But the next time that team comes to bat, the number six hole is still up may or may not be that substitute player depending on whether or not he met everything else but the spot in the batting order will remain the same <laughs> so you may find yourself uh doing a lot of education with coaches and scorekeepers until everybody gets kind of used to what we're trying to do there uh hopefully that's not as confusing as it sounds in my own ears when i try to explain it Go ahead, Stu. Yeah. Um, I'll go ahead and pause there before moving on. Anybody have any questions or any follow-up things there with the interference? Just to make sure that you can kind of revisit. We had like an inning-ending interference call on like a foul fly ball. And the debate last week was whether or not that would count for the person's mandatory play. And as Tom just mentioned, that would suffice for mandatory play. However, that position in the batting order would return. Um, so... Any other questions or any uncertainty, any follow-ups there here before we go moving on here, just to make sure we've got that uh, in a good place. And just to reiterate, last week we did say that if a runner is caught stealing for the third out, that does count as a mandatory at-bat. Tom's shaking his head yes. Okay. <clears throat> So yeah, and same situation there, Tom, right? It would count for his mandatory play, but that position in the order would return at the top of the next inning. Hey, That's Stu? correct, Stu. The way, the way the rule's written right now, it says, you know, if, if the third out is made, it's going to count as his, man, his time at bat for mandatory play 
pretty much regardless of how that third out is made, whether it's a, a runner caught stealing, a runner picked off a base at the higher levels, it still counts as his at bat, but the batting order is going to remain the same the next half inning for them. Awesome. Gary, go ahead. Um, Tom, I'm going to send you some background questions on both of those in that the definition of at bat, irregardless of mandatory play, is becomes a runner or is, you know, essentially retired at that, that point in time. If you've got a player who's retired on the foul fly, then that at batting spot is completed. And if you go to the OBR rule 10 on scorekeeping, that at bat slot is completed. I'm, I'm not sure how we can return the same batter to, to bat. The same thing on the, the caught stealing. The batter still standing there with the bat in his hands, hasn't completed anything. And we've got the third out. So I'll follow. I don't want to continue on with this uh, ad nauseum, but there, there's limited logic in my mind for those two interpretations. Back to you, Stu. Tom, anything else there? So. All right. I'll I'll await Gary's questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Perfect. That's that sounds good. Well, all right. I'm glad to do that. Thank Tom. Thank you for uh, taking time to get that for us and, and catching us up. It's been a, a good good conversation for us to have, and I think for everybody just to think through. And then patience always prevails. And uh, you know, as these new rules come up, they're definitely uh, good things for leagues, and and just requires us to think through some things. Be patient. Um, and then still just do what's in the best interest. So keep being patient. And as Tom said, be willing to educate your coaches. Uh, that way everybody's on the same page. Um, and, and, you know, just keep reaching out here for, for interpretations and things like that too. So, all right. Well, let's go ahead then and take a look at our interference smorgasbord here, so to speak. I call it the interference buffet. And really just kind of cleaning up like all the ancillary pieces uh, of interference that we haven't necessarily yet gotten to. So, you know, our scope here for us today kind of takes a look at a variety of different things, as I mentioned. Uh, but and what I do want to eventually circle back to is just this general question. And as we, and this is something that we'll come back to at the end of the session here today, just some of your big takeaways in our conversation about interference. What is something that, that has stuck out to you the most or what you have been reminded of the most? So many times people think that forgetting is not a good thing. Well, forgetting is part of remembering. Forgetting is part of learning, uh, too. So, you know, just kind of think about this question as we start to get back into our conversation with interference today. And then at the back end here, we'll circle back and have a discussion about, you know, hey, what are some of the big ticket items uh, that you can recall or, or that you that stuck out to you in our conversation of interference here. Now, one of the things that we've done continuously is we've talked about two different pieces of interference. Number one, criteria. And this is exactly what is said in the rule book that allows us to call interference. So what do we need to have interference? Well, we've used the word impede and hinder a ton. And those are two phrases that should continue to come about. Now, interestingly, one that does not come up very frequently, contrary to popular belief, is intent. So I think it's important for us to realize is that while intent can uh, give us interference, it's not a determining factor alone for interference with a few exceptions. And we'll talk about that. We talked about it last week with a thrown ball. We'll revisit that here this week. Uh, there's also the intent to break up a double play, which we'll clarify here this week as well. So it's important to note here that yes, intent does factor in interference, but it's not a determining factor. You do not have to have intent in order to have interference unless it's specifically addressed in the rule. Same is true with contact. Uh, contact is not necessary for interference. And sometimes just because there is contact does not mean that there's also interference. So just a couple things to think about there with your basic principles. Another big thing that we talked about last week, especially with the ball being fair or foul, um, the, the penalty and timing and the way that's written, something very important for us to realize. The rule says the runner is out and the ball is dead. So if we think about that in the context of our timing, you know, that runner's out, all right, time. Now let me figure out the rest of it. I think that timing uh, is important for us to realize along then with the fact that we use time of interference here in our rule book, uh, unless otherwise noted to award things for subsequent runners and things like that. Lastly, don't take the short end of the stick. Use common sense. If you see it and, and your, your gut says yes or no, kind of stick with that one. Take the Don't take the short end of the stick. You want to take the long end of the stick. And those have been really the basic criteria, the basic principles that we've revisited week by week here. And we're going to see that continue to play out in essentially what's left 
uh, of interference. So what exactly do we have left? We'll start with catcher's interference and the mechanics there. Interference on a retired teammate, which is actually more so for the double play, which we'll take a look at here as well. Uh, talk about clearing up interference on a double play. Some misconceptions there too. Uh, look at an example of coach's interference, and if there's enough time, we'll also take a look at spectator's interference. So a lot left on this buffet of interference here for us to go ahead and hit at today. All right, let's go ahead then and hit the catcher's interference stuff. And, and like always, guys, uh, you can you can pop up and, and ask any questions. You can use the chat and drop questions in there. I'll, I'll defer to DJ and to Seth to help monitor the chat too, if if they would be so willing to. So if you have any questions, obviously drop them in there uh, and speak up here as we go through uh, some things here too. So let's go ahead and talk about catcher's interference. You can find it two different places in the rule book. Obviously, rule two. And then 6.08C is essentially where I'm going here for us to start. Uh, catcher's interference uh, basically says here uh, the batter becomes a runner and is entitled to first base uh, when the catcher or fielder interferes with the batter. Now, the biggest thing for us to at least take away from this in, in, in our knowledge and obviously passing that knowledge on is to make sure that we allow the play to continue. Because if a play follows the interference, ultimately we can see an option come about here too. So we need to make sure that we understand that this is a delayed dead ball situation. And we'll talk about those mechanics here uh, as we pop up and take a look at some of those clips. Now, again, the other thing to also note here is, yes, we're going to allow that play to develop. So it's a delayed dead ball situation. And if the batter runner reaches first base and everyone else reaches uh, at least one other base, as you see here, the play proceeds without reference to the interference. So a couple things just to keep in mind here with regards to catcher's interference. Now, I've got two clips here for us to go through. That's the rule in black and white. Uh, anybody have any questions or anything like that here before we go ahead and take a look at two clips on enforcing and, and looking at, inter at catcher's interference? All clear in the chat. All right. So let's take a look here at a couple different clips. The first of which is just a basic clip uh, of interference. It's actually on a check swing. So some people say that you got to have a full swing. Well, there's nothing in the rule book that says catcher's interference is restricted to a full swing. So this is a check swing, a half swing, where we have catcher's interference. You can see right there, the bat makes contact with the catcher's glove, and the umpire is going to go ahead and call interference on this clip. So just a couple little looks here. Again, a check swing or full swing, whatever the case may be, when the bat makes contact with that catcher's glove, we've got catcher's interference. Now, a great look here at the mechanics. So let's go ahead and rewind this just a, a hair here. Let's take a look then at the mechanics of this plate umpire. We get the, we see it happen, and then take a look at what he does with his hand. He points down, says that's interference, and then as we've kind of talked about in our conversation with interference, we want to come out from behind the plate and take the spotlight. And remember, the spotlight is in the middle of the diamond. So we've got that's interference, plate umpire then calls time, and now he's taking that spotlight and putting it on him. Take a look at our situation in the bottom right-hand side of the screen. We've got a runner at first base. Remember what the rule says. Now we have to make awards. So we come out, take the spotlight, we point at R1, we send him to second base, and then we point at the batter runner and very clearly send him to first base. The timing, the pace, the, uh, the just the, the controlled consistency of this umpire's mechanics are fantastic. That's interference, time, very crisply and yet casually and controlled, points the runner to second base and then points the batter runner to first base. All right, here is our next clip here for me to go back through. Go ahead and pause it here. And this kind of gets into that whole idea that there, if there's a play that happens after it, we're going to allow that play to continue. So remember, it is a delayed dead ball. So let's take a look here at this clip, uh, an old one here, but we get catcher's interference on this one. And plate umpire kind of reaches up here, but again, just resist that urge if we can. Ball gets put in play. There's actually a runner at third base. You'll see that runner score right here. And now the, the batter runner is retired on a tag by the pitcher right there. So the first base umpire calls him out. Now, again, here's the interference. You can see the bat hit the glove. So we've got interference there. And then, again, this is a delayed dead ball situation. So we're going to let the play unfold. Good timing here. Good use of eyes. And then, again, because a play happened, now the manager, in this case it was Joe Girardi back when he was the manager of the Yankees, gets to decide, does he want the run and the out, or does the runner go back to third? Now we have a first and third situation, okay? So that's basically what we get to see here with catcher's interference. Again, big thing is it's a delayed dead ball, and if we have it in like we saw in the first example, take that spotlight, make sure we're clear in our awards, take your time, be very clear and audible. And obviously here, if you have a play, as we see in this Yankee clip, let it unfold 
and then ultimately come about then here with the option to the manager? Stu, great question here. What is the thought of informing a Little League coach of the option or expecting them to know there is an option? Yeah, Tom, I'll defer to you here on this one too because you've got some good guidance here on this one in terms of um, coaching up the coach, I guess you could say, in some context. I'll take it if Tom isn't, isn't going to weigh in. Um, so we, we don't – basically here, if we have this situation happen, um, it, we, the manager does have the option. So in this case, what I would do is I would call Tom, and I would just say that I have catcher's interference. And then because we had a result of the play, I would have to allow then or at least tell the coach here, like, hey, you have an option. So, you know, this is – our purpose is instructional. I think number one for us to make sure that we realize – um, and then secondly here, it's important for us to make sure that we're not necessarily coaching them to take one decision or the other. We're just telling them that either they have the option of the result of the play, which in this case was a run, or it would be first and third. And then the manager gets to make his decision from there. So I think it's nothing more than basically presenting him with, if you will, a multiple choice test. Does that help answer that question? Yeah. Hey, Stu, I finally found my unmute button. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One, one of the other things, uh, Stu made a great point. A lot of our role is instructional, especially at the, the younger ages where we're probably going to run into a lot more inexperienced or less experienced coaches uh, at, at the older levels or with a more experienced that I know is a more experienced coach. I'm going to make the award and then just turn around and say, coach, are we good? That's with a more experienced coach with with the, the poor guy who got roped into it because his kid wanted to play ball. Then I'm going to follow what what Stu was saying. Uh, I'm going to make the award and then walk to him and say, coach, you have an option here and walk away from him. Hopefully he'll come after me and say, Blue, what's my option? <laughs> then you, he's opened the door to allow you to explain what the rule does and does not say for him. So it, it, I think one of the phrases Gary loves to use, and I agree with it, is, is situational awareness of, you know, the, the level of ball that you're working when this happens to you. Absolutely. Good. DJ, anything else in the chat or any other questions there in the chat here over catcher's interference? Yeah, there was a good there was a good mechanics question asked uh, on the first clip just to address it. Uh, plate umpire left his mask on, you know, the interference and sent him. Um, and, and it was just why the question was, why did he do it? Um, yeah. obviously we want to try and get our mask off for visibility. Right. And, and I don't, I don't think you can go wrong either way. I think preferably, yeah, take your mask off, but, uh, at the same time, you know, it was very clear as to what he was calling. Um, and I think that's, that's the bottom line. Hey, hey Stu. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Uh, hey, uh, so, uh, I, I don't necessarily work a lot of the lower levels, but I do work, uh, some of the higher levels varsity and above. Um, even if the coach doesn't come out and say, I want this to happen, mm -hmm. if he comes out and says, God, I really wish that run would score. You can sit there and go, well, actually he can, here's what you got. Yep. So uh, don't, don't make, don't play gotcha umpiring on something like this. For sure. Cause you never know when that's going to bite you back in the butt. Like, like I said, we, we, we said it before. Don't take the short end of the stick. That's taking the short end of the stick. That, that's a great point, Eric. So, all right, we'll go ahead and move on then from catcher's interference if we're in good shape there. Um, and, and the next one is, is retired teammate here. And I think what's important for us to realize here in retired teammate is that this is generally the context where we pick up the back end of an automatic double play. All right, so just a couple of things here to think about this with, with interference on a retired teammate. Any batter or runner who has just been retired hinders or impedes. So again, those are the two words that we frequently come back to here. Uh, and I think what's important to note here is that you don't necessarily need like someone to make a throw or you don't need them to make a play. It says hinders or impedes any following play being made on any other runner. You're going to declare such runner out for the interference of a teammate. Now, again, where we see this most likely happen, and I'll show a clip of this one, is with regards to the double play. 
And this is the guidance that we have for, from the rim on the double play. Remember, there's no requirement for our runners to slide. They have to avoid contact. That's in Rule 7, which we'll talk about uh, in the future. As long as the runner is moving toward the base, there should generally be no interference. Now, what does it mean in terms of moving toward the base? Well, we must be able to reach the base then with hand or feet, provided that in reaching the base with hand or feet, in the umpire's judgment, that slide does not cause the fielder um, to, 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 to get in the way of trying to uh, um, complete the double play. So as you see here, yes, you've got to be able to reach the base with hand or feet. And in the umpire's judgment, if that slide caused the fielder not to complete the double play, then ultimately, ultimately we can call interference. All right. Last point here to at least kind of address here with the double play and interference on the teammate. Remember, if it happens, if that contact, if it happens after a throw has been released, we're probably going to let that one go because it happened after the release of that throw. It probably didn't exactly have an effect, as you see here, on the fielder's ability to complete the back end of that double play. So when we talk about like grabbing a back end of the double play, realize here that the rule we're generally going to use. Now, there is a rule specific to the double play, and I'll get to that here in just a second. But when we're talking about getting the back end of it, generally, this is the rule we're going to come back to, which is interference on a retired teammate. Let's look at some examples here real quick. So here's the one um, that, that's very clear. This is a fly pop up to the left side, foul ball. It'll be caught. And then there's a runner at third base who is tagging. So we have an attempted play at home plate, and it hits the batter who had just been retired. Bounces away. Joe West is our plate umpire. Take a look at his mechanics. Calls time and kills it. And guess what? The runner here, by which we have here at R3, now gets to be declared out. Good job here by Joe West. His mask is off. Very clear what he's doing. He's pointing at this runner here. He's out. And he's going to signify that we had interference on a retired teammate. And therefore, he's out. And Joe West gets a little swag. Gets a little Kobe Chuck with the ball back to the mound. Because uh, he knows he's right. And here's another look at this clip again. So we have the batter runner who's retired. Even though that there was no intent to interfere, he just kind of is in the path of this throw. He definitely impedes the catcher's ability to, uh, to retire a teammate or something like that. So this is a great call by Joe West. Remember, intent is not always a factor there for that interference. Okay? And again, a good, good call here by a retired teammate. And again, we get two, two outs in this one. One on the batter who had just been retired. And then obviously the runner at R3 would be out there. Now, again, we see this a lot of times come to us in the context of a double play. So some mechanics here to think about uh, as we're working multi-member crews that I'll also point out here as well. We get a ground ball to the left side, R1 only situation. We get a double play here. Okay, so here's the ball to second base. Take a look at the eyes of our second base umpire. He does a really good job, proper use of eyes. His eyes are down and on this play. He can see the slide attempt right through here. Now, he probably picks his eyes up just a little bit too quick for me. But even in this freeze frame, as you see that exchange, his eyes are right down on this slide. All right. So there's no doubt that he is exactly what he's looking. Wait, wait, he's, he is looking at exactly what he's supposed to. We get the return throw on the other side. Not exactly great. All right. First base umpire calls him safe. And then as you see here, the first base umpire realizes that something fishy had happened. Now, our second base umpire here in this case is now making his call. Now, again, I want to highlight here kind of the back end of it. Once you have this interference, take your time and be, be clear, be diligent, be very precise with what you're saying and your mannerisms. Just be very under control. So here you've got an out at second base. And then very clearly, we just need to step into the diamond and take the spotlight and say the batter runner now is out too because of interference on a teammate. And that would be number five, who is R1 sliding into the base. And you can see this umpire kind of starts to wander around, drift around, and he's making signals while he's moving. Just moving in the middle of the diamond, take the spotlight, and just go ahead and take your time in making it. Now, he does the right thing. He just kind of needs to, to absorb the spotlight and quit wandering around is really all I'm saying here in the back end of this clip. Another good look here at this one. Ground ball to shortstop. Right here's the slide. You can see here that this slide goes right into the fielder. We have contact, which probably prevents then um, this player from making a legitimate play on the back end of the double play in the mind of the umpire. That was judgment enough for him to go ahead and signal interference and get the back end of the double play. In this case, it was on a retired teammate because our one is out here, makes contact, and then slides away. Again, great use of eyes by our second base umpire to catch this one. Hey, Stu. Yep, <clears throat> go ahead, Gary. How do I differentiate an intentional interference 
by that runner coming into second base and a legal slide where the runner is not out until the last split second. I'm not, I have continuous play, so I'm not sure I can see interference by a teammate. The first one where he's at home plate, I can certainly see that. Mm -hmm. You know, the kid is already into the slide. Yeah. And 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 it's a legal slide. I think what we have to to think about here, and this is a great question, Gary, because uh, I, I kind of went back and forth on this one too. Now, in the rule, it says he's got to be able to reach the base by hand or feet. That's the guidance of our rim. But at the same time, like his slide here is not necessarily directly to the base. Um, and I think this is where our umpire did a really good job at getting this one. So if we take a look, this slide is more right at the second baseman as it is directly to the base. Now, we don't have a force play slide rule in our league or in our rule set or anything like that. So we can't use uh, OBR. We can't use the NCAA or the Federation rule here. Remember, he's got to be in reach of a of, of, of foot or, or reach of the hand. Uh, but at the same time here, I, I do believe that because of this contact, that is what was ruled that unnecessary. Uh, and as you can see, the majority of the runner's body is outside of the base. So in that, for the mindset of the umpire, was enough to get retired teammate here. I think that's where he ruled the intent, I guess, came into play. Yeah. Hey, Stu, can I add one thing? Does this, um, Good does this, fall, does this fall under the uh, the wording of obvious intent to break up a double no, play because that we that have in our rule code? No, because that's on a batted ball. And we'll get there here in just a second. That, that's one of the key <laughs> things to go ahead and play up. The, the obvious intent to break up a double play is on a batted ball. It's not on a, a thrown ball in this case. Stu, there's two mechanics things I'd like to point out really quickly. Um, Steven asked a good question. I'm going to defer right back to you here. Who's seeing this play in two-man umpire mechanics? Yep, two-man umpire mechanics is a great question. This would be the plate umpire who would come out. So uh, if you remember, like on a double play ball, we or like on a regular ball in the infield, we're on and up the line. On this one, we kind of take like a 45-degree angle, like right in between the cutout of the mound and like the first base line. So our eyes as the plate umpire in a two-umpire system should have um, our eyes on this one, not on the back end of the double play, uh, because obviously our field umpire would have two calls in. He would obviously have to call us at second in the two-man system as well as a call at first. So this one, the, the, the slide at second base is the legality of it, and if we can b- pick up interference on the back end, that is entirely belonging to the plate umpire because the base umpire's eyes are moving. Now, that doesn't mean that the base umpire cannot call it. However, the plate umpire has a better shot at it because his responsibilities are singular in that case. Um, second part, Eric makes a point. Uh, here in three, four, or six umpire crews, uh, you two or you three, whoever you are, you're able to keep your eyes on this play. There's no reason to track any follow-up throw to first base. Keep everything here for any follow-up play. 100 percent that's a great pickup and that was actually the communication that we gave when we watched this clip together as a crew after this game was that you know all you have to do and this is one of the point of emphasis that we constantly make on double plays at the regional is literally when you're u2 on this one just stare just continue to look right at it there's no need for you to go ahead and back and look back at the, the play at first base good point anything else here on this double play Again, remember, this is where we get, for the most part, retired teammate outs. Okay, that's where we can get the back end of the double play. All right. Now, Seth brought up the whole idea of the obvious intent to break up a double play. So let me go ahead and get to our next slide uh, that really kind of takes a look then at specifically interference on a double play. So this is the misconception I think people have to point out. We talked about interference on a retired teammate. That was the example that we just showed. But here we have a kind of two different situations, interference on a batter or a runner, when a base runner willfully and deliberately interferes with a batted ball. So many people miss that, that small little subtlety here. This is specific, this rule is, to a batted ball in, uh, or a fielder in the act of fielding, yet again, a batted ball with the obvious intent to break up a double play. In such case, then the umpire should call the runner out for interference um, and then the, get the back end of the double play as well. So what does this one look like? Well, if you think about like an R1 only situation, let's say it's a ground ball to the second baseman, say he's running and he like stops and starts and does one of those like turns. That's what we're talking about in this case, because this is a, and again, it's a batted ball, or in this case, a fielder in the act of feeling a batted ball. So it's not the case that we just saw. Remember what we just saw in those previous clips, that was retired teammate. 
Here, this is specific then to a batted ball. In no event then in that situation may bases be run or run scored because of that action by the runner. Okay, so just make sure that we realize here that the double play interference call is specific to a batted ball. Now, not only is this true to a batter, I'm sorry, a runner, but it's also true with a, a batter runner here as well. So the second part of this one here is on a batted, uh, on a batter runner. And if the batter runner willfully and de deliberately interferes, we have the same type of deal here with the breakup of a double play. Then we're going to go ahead and call the batter runner out. And then guess what? We get the runner out who's closest to the plate. So the penalty is a little bit different here with the batter runner than it was with the runner. And again, no, no bases may be run, no uh, runs can be scored. And when it involves the batter runner, then we're picking out the runner who is closest to home plate. Stu, um, there was a question there. Uh, so without willful and deliberate, we just play on. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. Yep, you got it. So I want to revisit a clip that we used last week here. Um, then we'll go ahead and start to, to wrap things up here as well. Uh, we, we saw this one last week. Remember, we talked about this one on the obvious intent here to uh, interfere with a thrown ball. And remember here, we had a conversation last week about this one as to whether or not we could get two outs on this play. And remember, the answer is no, because this is interference on a thrown ball, and the batter is out at that point. Again, remember the double play um, uh, interference call is specific to a batted ball. And as we see as this play continues, remember this is a ground ball to the first baseman, now this runner is no longer interfering with a batted ball. Now he's interfering with a thrown ball, which means that we cannot use the rule that we just went at to get the back end of the double play here. So he's out for interference of a thrown ball. Due to the rule, he's out at that point, and then we would award the batter runner first base in this case. I just wanted to circle back to this clip that we talked about last week to reiterate interference on the thrown ball with that intent. And again, to make sure that we were clear that if we're going to use the double play interference call, it has to be done on a batted ball. Any questions or anything else there here? Keep moving along here. All right, yeah. interference on a base coach. And I see what time it is. I'm going to get ready to, to, to start wrapping things up here in just a second here because this is the last one I think we really need to go ahead and talk about just to clarify some things, and then we'll go ahead and wrap some stuff up. So interference on a batter or runner when, in the judgment of the umpire, the base coach at third or first base by touching or holding the runner, and this is a key, physically assist that runner in returning to or leaving third or first base. So a couple things that are worth highlighting there to, to, that are highlighted not only in, in the context of this rule, but also from the rim. What physically assisting actually means here is that the coach had done something by touching the runner, which improved that runner's chance of accomplishing his or her goal of a runner. And that is to obviously reach the base uh, or the, the base safely next. Okay. So physically okay. assisting implies that the coach did something by touching the runner. This does not include a high five. It does not include a butt slap or something like that. Okay, He's literally got to make sure that this improved the runner's chance of accomplishing his or her goal as a runner. Touching alone does not constitute physically assisting. And in doing so, the umpire must be convinced that that touch, that that physical assist was enough by the coach to force that runner to either advance from or return to the base. Let's take a look at a pretty good example here. came to us from the 2015 Western region. Nice little infield hit. Thrown wild, and now kind of uh, it becomes Little League. So we start to throw it around a little bit, get into a pseudo rundown, throw this one away again, starts to scoot past. Now the runner advances to third base, and it looks like, by all stretch of the imagination, the play is over. Keep your eye on the third base coach here. Okay? So... You know, time has never been called, even though this team was the defense was asking for time. Time had never been called. ESPN starts to flash to the crowd to the mom who's who's panicked. Um, and everybody seems to start to go on to, all right, that play's over. Let's go ahead and get set for the next play. Now remember, I said, look at the third base coach. Okay. ESPN actually goes to replay right as the third base coach starts to make a very controversial action. Goes right to the replay there. And then here is, a, here is a look at the third base coach. Everybody take a look here at the third base coach. So here he is. Play looks like it's dead. Defense has asked for time, time and time again. Never been granted. And then here, look at the third base coach. He actually gives a little bit of a force enough to force the, the, the runner to lean forward. 
And this umpire sees it right out of the gate. Great use of eyes here. Awesome use of eyes by U3 in this one. He's pointing right at it. He takes the spotlight. Very good. And he's got him red-handed, just like a cop would. He's got him right there. He points, you interfered with him. Yes, you did. And then he points at the runner and says, you're out. And this ends the game. Ends the game. Interference there by the coach on a physical assist. Here's another look at exactly what it was. Here's the coach. Gets back. You can see the push, lean forward, and then that runner goes. A little dance by the third base coach, and he scores. And if we go back to the rule, okay, if we go back to the rule here and what it says from the rim, uh, even though touching alone does not constitute physically assisting, the umpire had to be convinced that that physical assist, that that push, allowed him to either advance from or return to the base. That improved the chance of that runner accomplishing his or her goal. It's a great example here then of, 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 of coach assist interference there. Any questions there here? No. All right. Well, guys, that's uh, that, that, that's the, the kind of smorgasbord of interference here that's left. Uh, spectators interference was something else that we were out there for. We don't necessarily see spectators interference all that often in Little League. Uh, but remember, in spectators interference with that case, it requires a spectator to actually lean over and into the field of play, um, in which then they interfere with a live ball. If a fielder is going into the stands, if a fielder is going into the stands, he or she does so at his own risk and would not be protected. So in order to have spectator interference, they would have to interfere then uh, on the field or over the field of live play with a live ball. Okay, so that kind of wraps up then uh, the, the loose ends, if you will, of uh, interference. Any hey, hey, Stu. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Sorry, uh, really quick. So you have a play at the plate, and uh, so you have uh, either the on-deck hitter or a runner that scored previously uh, basically push a, a runner – the mm -hmm. came in after him to go touch uh, touch home plate that he missed. Does that count as uh, coach's interference? Um, so coach's interference is specific to coach's interference. So we don't necessarily have anything there uh, to be able to use the coach's interference penalty on a teammate uh, and a teammate assist. And to my knowledge, in, in looking things up in Little League, in our rules, we don't have a teammate assist um, specific rule for interference. The only, that, the only the only exception I have to that is if you have one of your your players as a base coach, then I do believe you can get that because they are in that case they are a base coach, not a teammate. Correct. The, that that's why I specifically asked yep. that particular one about because uh, that's usually where we'll see a teammate assist is uh, is a runner missing home, and the on deck better or a previously scored runner. Go, hey, go back, go back, go back, and shove him. Yeah. So we don't we don't have anything specific in our rule book that really addresses that. Um, anybody else have anything to weigh in on that one? Because this is a really good question. Hey, Stu. Yep, go ahead, Greg, Gary. Real quick, a similar situation that will pop up a lot is a runner coming around third base, trips and falls down. Mm -hmm. If the coach picks the kid up, that's the interference. If a teammate comes right up behind him and picks him up, that, like you say, we don't have a rule against that. That is perfectly legal. Perfect. Yep. Great explanation. As long as it doesn't pass them. Yeah. As long as, as it doesn't pass them. That's conversation for, for later. We'll get there when we get to awards and appeals and stuff like that. So, well, great. Well, guys, I appreciate everyone uh, and, and your participation, your questions, and your engagement here. Uh, just a couple of main, main reminders here or, or to wrap things up here. Uh, first of all, remember, we're off next week, so there, there is no meeting here for us next week due to Easter weekend. Enjoy the time with your families and uh, enjoy the week off here, so to speak. When we come back, we'll return on April the 9th. Uh, on April 9th, we'll go ahead and take a look at not only just the context of interference, but more so start to look at it with regards to obstruction. So it'll be about a three or four week journey here um, on um, uh, obstruction, uh, on type A obstruction and type B obstruction. We'll break it down into categories just as we did here with interference. And again, that series will start April the 9th. We'll be in touch next week with a bunch of resources that we had from season four. So if you miss any of those resources, whether it be the PowerPoints, the rules quizzes, or whatever the case may be, we'll pump those out. And then also remember here to be on the lookout from a, a video on the 2021 focal points for many of you guys that are getting ready to take the season. Season. Some things to work on as you get on the field. Uh, the Central Region Umpire Advisory Committee will get together and take a look then at uh, the five major focal points that we have for the 2021 season, give you some ideas and some things to work on here moving forward there. 
I want to thank you guys again for your participation. Thank uh, my, my team of creative minds, DJ and Seth. I really appreciate you two. Uh, and then a variety of other individuals that reach out week after week uh, with some advice, some feedback, and some just general thoughts. I really appreciate you guys in contributing to the show and then ultimately uh, making sure that what we do is beneficial for all and that everybody has something uh, to get out of it. Last thing I got for me is that many of you guys are aware that we did lose a Central Region umpire um, over the course of the last week, Andy LaTurner. He died from complications with um, the coronavirus and trying to recover from them. Very sad story, and, and, and he's not unique. There's been a lot of people that have obviously endured that one here. So just keep his, his family in your thoughts. A lot of you guys are going to get together and go to his services this weekend. Safe travels to all of you. Enjoy each other's company and obviously enjoy the opportunity to celebrate the life of a fellow umpire here. So um, other than that, guys, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy the week off and Easter weekend. And we'll see everybody then on April the 9th then for our return of 3 Up, 3 Down. We'll go ahead and talk a lot about uh, obstruction. Thanks again for being here, guys. And then I'll see everybody then on April 9th. Have a good one.